Villanova is getting all the negative attention, but it's fair to wonder if the entire Big East is in trouble this season. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Thursday and welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast the only daily national college hoop show out there, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton. You're joining us at the place to get your college basketball content Monday through Friday, 52 weeks out of the year. I want to give a special shout out to those everyday listeners and those of you hanging out with us in the Locked On College Basketball Discord channel and remind you that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you will get $20 off your first purchase. Well, we got a pair of fun matchups on Thursday to preview. We're going to talk about those to close out the show. We also got some recruiting talk, uh, some players who made some commitments, including Malik Thomas going to Arkansas, big win for John Calipari. But first, we got to talk about the Big East. And I know that my co-host Isaac Shade and Leaf Tulane spoke about Villanova's loss on Wednesday's episode. Uh, We're not going to spend too much time litigating Kyle Neptune and his job security and the fact that Villanova's 2-2 and with that loss to Columbia and then, of course, that other loss to St. Joe's. Uh, It's been a rough start to what was a really critical season for Kyle Neptune and Villanova, and I think it is fair to wonder whether this will be the last season for him as the head coach, but... The Big East is struggling outside of just Villanova, and I think that it's fair to have a, have a conversation. We're only you know 10 or so days into the season. Obviously, things are brand new at this point, and certainly some of these teams that are off to slow starts are probably going to turn things around. Uh, but with a lot of teams, even some of the better teams in the conference, having some pretty challenging schedules coming up, I think it's fair to start to wonder if things are going to start to get even uglier for the Big East Conference going forward. So we'll start with Villanova again quickly. We've already talked about them quite a bit, but their next few games, they got Virginia on the 15th, Penn on the 19th, and then Maryland on the 24th, and then they'll eventually play Cincinnati on December 3rd. Those teams at Ken Palm, 97th for Villanova, 244 for Penn, 30th for Maryland, and then 14th for Cincinnati. I'm really curious how Villanova is going to do in that stretch of games. You know, they're they're going to clearly be favored against Penn. They'll probably be favored against Villa, or Virginia, excuse me. But Maryland and Cincy are going to be tough games. If they lose both of those, you really got to pick up two of those other games, if not, or both of those other games, if not, at least, at least one of them. If you go two and two uh, in that four-game stretch there, it's going to get pretty ugly for Kyle Neptune's team. So we'll see if they're able to find a way to get some offense from anybody not named Eric Dixon and move forward from there. Looking at the rest of the Big East, so the only teams that have losses in the conference are Butler, who is two and one, and Seton Hall, who, as I'm recording right now, is one and one on the season. They are in the midst of a game against Hofstra, where they are up one point with about 14 minutes to go. Uh, they've only scored 30 points in the first 36 minutes of action here in this one, or 26 minutes of action in this one. So, We'll see if they're able to pull off a victory. I'll try to get an update for the end of the show. But, uh, yeah, it's been a, a tough season for Seton Hall, Shaheen Holloway. For those of you who have been longtime listeners to the show, you know that I'm a huge Shaheen Holloway supporter. I loved what he did at St. Peter's on that miracle run in the NCAA tournament. I was excited about him getting hired at his alma mater at Seton Hall. And through the last couple of years, there's been some, okay, well, it's not exactly his fault. They don't have a ton of NIL money, and they had injuries or so-and-so. But, you know, at this point, you got to be able to score some points and they're just not able to put together a team with enough offensive firepower to get it done. And at some point, again, if, if that doesn't change for Shaheen all the way at Seton Hall, uh, they're going to have to make a move over there because this has just not been an experiment that has worked as well as people hoped that it would when he got hired a couple of years ago. But I wanted to talk about Three of the teams expected to finish at or near the top of the Big East. We're not worried about UConn. UConn looked amazing against LeMoyne. They have not played a challenging schedule up to this point, but they have done exactly what they need to do by blasting everybody they've played. They're going to continue to do that until they start playing some real competition, which is coming up soon. They got Baylor, Texas, Gonzaga all in the non-conference. So going to be some really good games for the Huskies here soon. Uh, And then you have... uh, 
St. John's, St. John's has looked good. They were a little sloppy uh, in their game against Wagner on Wednesday, but they round, they righted the ship. They got it done when they needed to in the second half. Uh, Rick Pitino's team continues to be uh, undefeated, continues to be in the top 25, and should continue to be uh, in that spot going forward. But want to talk about Marquette, Creighton, and Xavier, the three teams that kind of a lot of people have them at 2-3-4 or 3-4-5 or 2-3-5, some combination of being three of the top five teams in the Big East. And none of them have taken any losses yet yet at this point in the season, but eh, it's fair to have some questions about how these teams are looking right now. Marquette, I'm really significantly concerned about Marquette's rebounding and their lack of interior offensive presence. Marquette was out-rebounded by 15 against Central Michigan in their most recent game. 39 rebounds for Central Michigan, just 24 for the Golden Eagles of Marquette. They tied George Mason, 35 rebounds apiece in that game. So they have not been rebounding well, and they haven't played. And George Mason is fine. Central Michigan's fine. They're not like, you know, Mississippi Valley State or anybody like that. But they're they're teams you should – any power team should be out-rebounding them. Any top 25 team should be out-rebounding them. And this team – they don't have Oso Iguodaro anymore, and it shows. This is a team that is missing that interior presence. We had this question about them coming into the year as they were kind of replacing Oso's uh, production with Ben Gold moving into the starting lineup, who's a talented three-point shooter who isn't much of an interior presence. David Joplin stepped into a bigger role, and he's not much of an interior presence either. And as of right now, Marquette is shooting just over 29 two-point attempts per game. That's 325th in the country. They're in the near the bottom 30 in the entire country in two-point attempts per game. They are 13th in the country in three-point attempts per game, which makes sense. You'd expect a team that's not taking very many twos, especially a team that moves at a pretty good pace like Marquette, to be taking a lot of threes. Here's the problem. Marquette's averaging 34 three-point attempts per game, top 15 in the country. They're knocking them down at a 29.4% clip. That is 278th. Yes, I fully expect Marquette's three-point shooting to improve as the season goes on. They are not a team that is going to shoot sub-30% as a team going forward this season. I feel fairly confident in that. And it's pretty easy to look at some of the players on this roster and see the huge spread between how many two-point attempts they're taking, how many three-point attempts they're taking, and their current rate of production in those two areas. We'll start with Joplin shooting about 54% on two-pointers. That's on a little over four attempts per game, but he's shooting 23% on 8.7 three-point attempts per game. Dude is hacking up twice as many threes as twos and making them at a much, much lower clip. Ben Gold, we mentioned him earlier. He's shooting 60% on less than two two two-point attempts per game. Meanwhile, he's shooting 19% on seven three-point attempts per game. And then Royce Parham, 80% on less than two two two-point attempts per game. 9%. 9% on just under four three-point attempts per game. And yes, I said it again. I'll say it again. There is going to be positive regression. Ben Gold is probably not going to shoot 19% for the full season. Joplin's going to shoot better than 23%. Parham's going to shoot better than 9%. But Cam Jones is currently shooting 50% from three. That's probably going to change. Chase Ross is shooting 54.5% on three. That's probably going to change. Stevie Mitchell shooting 75% from three. That is very clearly going to change. So there's going to be some negative regression for this team as well. Ultimately, while I expect the three-point percentage for this team to overall land somewhere higher than 29.5%, that is not going to fix the issue for Marquette if they continue to be a team that relies so heavily on the three-point shot while also being a bad rebounding team. That is a bad combination because in games where you do not knock them down, which happens, you're just going to have off-shooting nights. If you cannot clean up, you cannot get second-chance opportunities – you're going to lose games you have no business losing. I am significantly concerned about Marquette going forward this year. We'll not spend as long on Creighton and Xavier. Creighton got tested in their first game of the season against Utah Rio Grande Valley. Uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner dropped 49 in that game, and they needed every single bit of it. Now, Pop Isaacs did not play in that game. He is back uh, and played in their second game and looked pretty good. He's still got to, to get adjusted and get his feet 
underneath him playing for a new team in a new system. But uh, I'm not worried about Creighton's off offense. I'm worried about them defensively. Uh, their adjusted defensive efficiency at Ken Palm right now is 60th. They have one of the worst steal rates in the entire country. Uh, again, they've only played two games and they played one of them without Pop Isaacs. So I do think that will change. But right now, Ball State, Moorhead State, Alabama A&M are the only three teams in the country who have a worse steal rate than Creighton up to this point. My bigger issue with Creighton outside of the defense is their depth. Uh, especially at the forward positions. Uh, Mason Miller is just not a big offensive player. He never has been. Uh, Jason Green hasn't looked great offensively for this team yet either. Uh, I do think things will get better for them depth-wise, especially if they're able to get Fedor Zugic, uh, the Montenegrin freshman. If he can get eligible and start playing for them, I think that's going to help a lot as well. Creighton's got Nebraska, San Diego State, Texas A&M, Oregon, Kansas, UNLV, and Alabama all coming up in the non-conference schedule. That is a murderer's row of really quality opponents for them to face. Uh, I think that's going to help make them more prepared for the Big East schedule and more prepared for the NCAA tournament. But the way this team has looked defensively, I'm not super confident they're going to come out of that slate looking as good as people are expecting them to. Xavier is, I, I'm less concerned about Xavier. I also had less expectation for Xavier coming into the season. I know a lot of folks had them ranked in the preseason. I wasn't quite ready to put Sean Miller's team there yet. Uh, they've picked up three wins, nine-point win over Texas Southern, who's 276th at Ken Palm, a 14-point win over IU Indianapolis, who's 360th, and then the 37-point win over Jackson State. So they did what they needed to do uh, in that game against the Tigers. Uh, but Xavier shooting 44% from three, that's going to come down. But I do like this team's makeup if they are able to stay healthy, which was their big issue last year. Zach Fremantle has been great. If he can stay healthy, that's going to put this team in a position to to compete for a spot near the top of this conference, but I still am a bit of a skeptic and a pair of close wins over teams that are not very good. Doesn't make me feel great about this team, especially when you consider that they shot out of their minds from three and still didn't exactly inspire a ton of confidence with the margin of victories in those games. UConn looks great. St. John's look great. Providence looks pretty darn bad. I'm not at all confident in Providence. Again, they haven't lost yet, but they nearly lost to Central Connecticut and Hampton. Central Connecticut's 223rd at Ken Palm. Hampton's 318th. Georgetown and DePaul, there's not a lot of high expectation for either of them, and they haven't looked at the part yet. DePaul needed overtime to beat Southern Indiana, who's outside the top 300 at Ken Palm. Uh, Georgetown had tight wins over two teams outside the top 250 in Ken Palm. So all in all, I'm just not feeling that great about the Big East right now. I'd be happy to be wrong. I love this conference, but it's been a pretty rough start for the entire league up to this point. And I think UConn's clearly in a good spot, even if I'm not as confident about this UConn team as I was the previous two years, they're in a good spot to win the league because I'm not sure the rest of the, the teams, the Marquettes and the Creightons of the world, don't feel like they're in as good of a spot to contend as they were last year. I think it's going to be up to Rick Pitino and the Johnnies to really challenge Crate, or excuse me, UConn at the top of this conference. Well, folks, John Calipari now has the top point guard and the top shooting guard in the 2025 recruiting class headed to Arkansas. We're going to break down Malik Thomas's decision and more coming up here in just a second. But first, folks, get ready to tackle the NFL action this season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. And the FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more all on the same page where you place those bets. And since we're talking a little bit about Arkansas, they are at plus 1,200 right now to make the Final Four. If you're thinking John Calipari is back, baby, he's getting this team from Fayetteville into San Antonio for the Final Four, if you're feeling good about it, visit FanDuel.com to join today. As a reminder, you will get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. It's FanDuel.com, America's number one sportsbook. All right, folks, segment two, still any patents, still locked on college basketball podcast, moving away from our conversation, uh, expressing some concern for the Big East Conference in the early goings of the season to talk about four prospects who made commitments in the last couple of days, obviously it was signing day on Wednesday. So a lot of players officially confirmed that they are signing at schools where we already knew that they were planning to go there. So instead, we're focusing on guys where in the last two or three days, they have made new commitments that we had not previously had discussed. So we're going to talk first about the one five-star in this group, Malik Thomas, 
the number 11 ranked recruit in the 2025 recruiting class. That's according to 247 Sports. He committed to Arkansas, six foot three combo guard from Overtime Elite in Atlanta. He picked Arkansas over UConn and his hometown Pitt Panthers. Kansas, Kansas State, Bama, and Auburn were in the mix there as well. Uh, but Arkansas was not the favorite here. John Calipari kind of came from behind to secure the recruitment here to, to secure the services of Malik Thomas. This is something John Calipari is really good at. You can have questions about his uh, slow to adjust to the modern college basketball game and struggles in the NCAA tournament and blah, blah, blah. The man knows how to land premier high school talent. He knows how to put him in the league. And Malik Thomas is a phenomenal addition for John Calipari's team. This kid is really, really good. And more than that, as we've seen so often, this team is going to be not just dominant with freshmen and young players, but young guards. That is what John Calipari is a lead at. Look at the, I mean, half the All-Star game last year, not quite, but ge genuinely 30% of the NBA All-Stars last year came from Kentucky under John Calipari. Uh, many of them were guards, Tyrese Maxey, Devin Booker, De'Aaron Fox, et cetera, et cetera. And now in the 2025 class, John Calipari is bringing in Darius Acuff, and Malik Thomas, Acuff is the number one ranked point guard in the 2025 class. Malik Thomas, the number one ranked shooting guard. Those two guys are going to be great. They're going to be great in the SEC. They're going to be a problem for the Alabamas, the Auburns, the Tennessees of the world. who are going to have to figure out how to defend two of the best scoring guards, highest upside players in the entire conference next season in Fayetteville for John Calipari and the Hawks. Three other four stars who made commitments in the last couple of days. First up, this commitment came on Wednesday. It was one of the only like surprise commitments of signing day. Four star Samis Calderon commits to Kansas, the 55th ranked recruit in the 2025 class. That's at 247's composite rankings. He's a six foot eight small forward, also playing for overtime elite. So current teammates with Malik Thomas. Uh, he's a Brazilian native, uh, and he is a very, very good athlete. Six foot eight small forward who has a seven foot three wingspan, a 38 inch vertical, and had the fastest full court sprint time of anybody at the overtime elite system. So this kid flies up and down the floor. He's super long. He's got a super high vertical, and he's a darn good basketball player to boot. He picks Kansas over Michigan, Tennessee, and Auburn. Those are the four schools that he took official visits. Uh, Bill, Seth, Bill Spelf gets another one. And while you might be thinking, okay, a six foot eight small forward with those measurables, those that athletic ability, who's going to Kansas, why is he 55th in the class? Well, the shooting needs work. There is a bit of a question of whether he can be a, a dynamic enough scorer at the collegiate level. There's a question of whether he can be a dynamic enough scorer at the collegiate level. He's also a bit of a tweener positionally. He's kind of a small forward, power forward hybrid. Uh, he's KJ Adams-esque. Uh, in the sense that he's the similar size and a super high-level athlete. He's not projected necessarily to be the kind of rebounder he is, but that's the kind of role of like a, a dirty work, utility-type player, not necessarily a go-to scoring option, not necessarily a, hey, you know, Bill Self's not bringing him in to lead the team in scoring uh, or to take a whole bunch of threes. He's bringing him in to do the dirty work, be that rugged, physical, I'm going to get a bunch of rebounds, I'm going to, you know, dive on the floor for loose balls. I'm going to do things that don't show up in the box score type kid. And when you have those kind of measurables, that speed, that wingspan, that jumping ability, you're going to be able to get a lot of good stuff done. So this is a nice, nice addition here for Bill Self and the Jayhawks. The second prospect for Kansas in that 2025 class uh, after the third ranked player in the class, Darren Peterson, committed to Bill Self earlier this offseason. Two more four-star players to talk about. Caden Magwood commits to Auburn. Uh, Auburn missed out on both Malik Thomas and Samir Samis Calderon, but they do land Caden Magwood, a six-foot-one guard from the Combine Academy in Charlotte, 44th-ranked player in the 2025 class at 247. He picked Auburn over NC State and Ole Miss, and he is the second commit in the class for Bruce Pearl besides uh, alongside Simon Walker, a shooting guard. He's a six foot one combo guard. So he's an undersized kind of two. He can play the point, but he's kind of a high scoring score first guard. Uh, and this is a, a archetype that we've seen a lot of at Auburn. Bruce Pearl loves these types of players. And in fact, when Magwood was speaking to 247 Sports about his decision to commit to Auburn, he mentioned, Bruce Pearl told me, um, I remind him of Sharif Cooper. Yeah, that he sounds a lot like Sharif Cooper. Sounds a lot like that archetype again. And this is somebody that, uh, you know, I, I like when players 
pick schools and pick systems that seem to fit them. I watched some clips of Caden Magwood. I'm not, you know, I didn't watch a ton of his his clips or anything like that. But from what I've seen from the scouting reports I've read, from what I know about Bruce Pearl and Auburn and the types of players they recruit, this feels like a really good fit. And sometimes you see players try to get cued and they try to go to systems that maybe don't seem on paper like good fits. So it's nice to see a guy go, yeah, this this is the kind of system that likes these undersized, super athletic, high scoring guards. So that's what I am. That's where I'm going to go. And I think it's going to work out quite nicely for him and for Bruce Pearl and the Tigers. Last but not least, J.J. Mandicott commits to Washington. Danny Sprinkle picks up a nice uh, player here, a four-star, number 49 ranked recruit in the class by the 247 composite rankings, the sixth ranked point guard in the class. Six foot one point guard currently playing at Utah Prep. Uh, he's from Hawaii, from Hilo, Hawaii, but he's playing at Utah Prep, the same high school that currently houses A.J. Dibansa. Washington does have an offer out to Dibansa. I uh, can't say that it hurts to land his point guard in J.J. Mandicott, but I don't think Washington's a super realistic, likely outcome place for Dibansa to end up. But if you're not going to land Dibansa, at least you land, the again, a borderline top five prospect in the class is a pretty good get for Sprinkle and the Huskies. Uh, Mandicate had offers from BYU, which makes sense as they are pursuing Dibansa as well. He also had offers from Louisville, Cal, Creighton, Tennessee, USC, and UCLA, among many others. Uh, the second commit in the 2025 class for Washington outside of Cortland Muldrew from Oak Hill Academy in Virginia. He's a shooting guard. So two guards joining Danny Sprinkle's team in Montlake uh, as for Washington in their second year in the Big Ten. Uh, it's a nice start on the recruiting trail for Danny Sprinkle and the Huskies. Well, Thursday's slate is not exactly great. There are no ranked teams in action tonight, but there are two exciting games that both involve injured players making their season debuts, and we're going to break them both down coming up here in just a second. The first, folks, the college basketball season is here, and there is nothing better than the atmosphere at a college hoops game. The anticipation of what's about to happen, the energy of the crowd, the unexpected coming to life, thrilling wins, and more. And thankfully, there's a ticketing app called Game Time that helps you get great tickets at a great price. And great news, when you're getting tickets for this year, Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks with curation that makes it easier to save on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Whether it's Game Time's ticketing coverage, the lowest price guarantee, or the panoramic views from your seat in the app, Game Time has got you covered. Kansas State hosts LSU Thursday night. If you want last-minute tickets, you can get a pair of tickets in Section 17. $7 a piece in the lower bowl. That is an incredible deal. Do not miss it. Snap them up right now if you can. And folks, you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College, and you'll get twenty dollars off your per first purchase. Those two tickets could be free if you were to go use Game Time right now and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms do apply. Download the Game Time app today. What time is it? Game Time. All right, folks, closing out the show today with a preview for the games on Thursday. Thursdays tend to be some of the slower days during the college basketball regular season. Early on, it's in part because they don't want to compete with Thursday night football in the NFL. Later in the season, it just feels like a lot of the conferences don't utilize Thursdays very often. It's either Fridays or Saturdays. Uh, or a lot of teams Tuesdays or Wednesdays. The Pac-12 was kind of one of the biggest conferences that had a lot of regular Thursday night conference matchups. There is no Pac-12, so I don't think there's going to be a lot of great Thursday games throughout the year. But we have two games that we want to focus on for tonight. We mentioned LSU at Kansas State. We'll close with that one. But first, we go to the state of Arizona where Bryce Drew and the Grand Canyon Lopes take on Arizona State, 9 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN2. FanDuel currently has Grand Canyon favored by two and a half points. This is a very even matchup between the Ken Palm 67th ranked team in Arizona State and the Ken Palm 71st ranked team in Grand Canyon. And it's also the first time these two teams have met since 2021, despite being two of the premier basketball programs in the state of Arizona. ASU's 2-1 and one on the season, wins over Idaho State and Santa Clara. Their loss was an eight-point loss to Gonzaga. That was actually closer than that. Uh, they had leads in uh, they had multiple leads in the second half of that game. Uh, really nice performance from Bashir Jihad in particular. He had 22-10 on 7-14 of 14 shooting the transfer from Ball State. Uh, 
this team has been led primarily by B.J. Freeman and Austin Mason, who are each averaging just over 13 points per game. Team struggles offensively. They're only 99th at Ken Palm and adjusted offensive efficiency, but they are 44th in defensive efficiency, in large part due to very young but very, very high upside freshman Jaden Quintance, who is averaging just five points and five boards, but also four blocks per game, again, through three games. So he has 12 blocks in three games. Fouls are an issue for him, but he's a 17-year-old freshman. He's so young that he has to be in college for two years. And already he had a three, he had a blocked three-point shot. It was Ben Gregg was taking a three for Gonzaga, and Quintance jumped out there, Zion Williamson style, and swatted it into the crowd. This dude is going to be really, really good. He's already pretty darn good on the defensive end. Once he finds the offense and limits the fouls, he's going to be outstanding. Uh, Arizona State also has another top freshman, 24th ranked player in the 2024 class. Uh, Josan Sinone, who's been a little questionable. He, he had some moments against Gonzaga, but also kind of disappeared. But he's just a young kid. I'm excited to see what Bobby Hurley's team can do going forward this year. But I think the big storyline in this game is the return for Tyon Grant Foster in Grand Canyon. Grant Foster averaged 20 points per game last year, along with six boards, 1.7 steals, and one and a half assists. He was a preseason All-American pick by many, many places, including Jay Billis, who had Grant Foster on his All-American second team. But despite the fact that he has not played in the first two games of the season, Grand Canyon is still 2-0 on the year. They also did not have their starting center, Duke Brennan, who in fact transferred from Arizona State, and both players are expected to be back. So that's the big storyline in this game, is Grand Canyon's going to Arizona State. Their two starters from last year are going to be back after missing the first two games of the season. One of them used to play at Arizona State. One of them is projected to be an All-American. It doesn't get a whole lot better than that if you're talking about a, a day where there's not any ranked game, ranked teams playing. That is the kind of intrigue you want to see in a matchup like this. Brennan uh, averaged 6.7 boards, 58% from the field last year for the Lopes. Uh, very good player in the front court. Grant Foster, again, a 20-point-per-game scorer, an oversized point guard. He's like a 6'6", 6 6'7", player who's got the ball in his hands a lot. Should create some matchup problems for the Sun Devils. Uh, for GCU, their wins are over Cal State Fullerton and Western Kentucky. Uh, their two stars so far this year have been Jacoby Coles, the transfer from TCU, who's averaging 21 and 12, and then Ray Harrison, who's been there for what seems like a, an eternity. Uh, and he's averaging 14 and a half points and 3.7 assists. Those two guys should continue to be really, really good forces for Bryce Drew's team, but the return of Tyon Grant Foster and Duke Brennan should elevate this program back into that top 50, top 40, maybe even top 25 conversation as the year goes on. Final game we want to preview here, LSU. The Tigers go on the road to take on Jerome Tang and the Wildcats of Kansas State. This game is also at 9 p.m. Eastern time. It is being relegated to ESPN+. Plus. However, Kansas State favored five and a half points in this one. Really, really close matchup. Ken Palm has these two teams right next to each other, 49 and 50 uh, currently. 49 for LSU, 50 for Kansas State. So again, the first game is 67 versus 71. This game is 49 versus 50. If you're not going to get any top 25 teams in action, you can't ask for a whole lot better than these two matchups here. Wish they weren't starting at the same time, but hey, that's what split screens are for. LSU's 2-0 on the season, wins over UL Monroe by 35 and Alabama State by 13. Uh, Cam Carter has been the stud for the Tigers, 21 points, three and a half boards per game. Seeing a bit of a, a mini breakout so far for junior forward Jalen Reed. Uh, he's averaging 15 points through the first two games of the season. He averaged just under eight points per game last year. So perhaps a player to keep an eye on for that squad. Richmond transfer DGI Bailey, 14 points, six and a half boards and three assists for him. Main question for LSU is if they can compete for a spot in the NCAA tournament, it's going to be really hard in the SEC. There's six, seven, eight, nine, potentially 10 teams that could make it from the SEC. Uh, this team has a really strong non-conference schedule, which I think will help them. Not only do they play Kansas State, they'll also play Pitt, Florida State, Florida Gulf Coast, SMU. If they can go three and two in those games and finish around 500 in the SEC, I think that might be enough. You got to finish 500 in the SEC and, and beat a couple of the good teams. You can't lose every game to Auburn and Bama and Tennessee and Arkansas and Kentucky. If you beat, if you win a couple of those games, maybe you've got a chance of sneaking in. Uh, but this is a, a matchup that matters to them. If they can beat this Kansas State team on the road, that helps strengthen their resume quite a bit. 
Kansas State uh, has been an interesting team up to this point. We talked about the return of Tyon Grant Foster. The big story for Jerome Tang's team is that they will get a core, a core back in the mix transfer uh, who hasn't played so far this season. We're kind of curious if he's going to start for this team. Because the starting lineup that they have run out so far has been pretty interesting. It's not what we expected at all. They're starting both Joneses, Max and Christian Jones, as well as Brendan Housen, the Villanova transfer. David Nagesson is starting at the four, and Coleman Hawkins starting at the five, uh, sort of. He's a small ball five in this situation. But the main storyline is Doug McDaniel, the Michigan transfer, averaged 16 points a game last year for the Wolverines, is not in the starting lineup, and the other two bigs, Bay Fall, Arkansas transfer, and Agana Nienso, Kentucky transfer, both coming off the bench. And in fact, Nienso is playing less like nine minutes per game up to this point in the season. I thought he was going to be a much bigger part of the puzzle for Jerome Tang and the Wildcats. Has not been that yet. And with the Chora Chora returning very soon, he's not a center, but he's more of a three four hybrid. I think he's more of a power forward. So I'm very curious who he replaces in the starting lineup because. Nagesson's averaging 16 and a half points per game. I don't think Coleman Hawkins is going to come out of the starting lineup. So do you bench one of the guards and go with a bigger lineup? I think the, the player who's the struggled the most in the starting lineup up to this point has been uh, Max Jones, but I don't know if he's necessarily who you replace in the lineup. So I'm going to be watching for that pretty closely. I'm going to be very curious how Kansas State makes this starting lineup work, what changes they make with the chore chore back in the mix. Uh, the player who's been the most who's done the most for them up to this point in the season, which again, they've only played two games, uh, but it's been Brennan Housen, Villanova transfer averaging 19 and a half points per game through their first two games. Uh, again, wasn't expecting him to be their leading scorer. Uh, Doug McDaniel, only six points per game, but he is averaging six assists and three and a half steals per game coming off the bench uh, for Kansas state. Strong non-conference schedule as well. Not as strong, but strong comparatively to the other Big 12 schools. Uh, not only playing LSU, but they're also playing St. John's and Wichita State. Uh, the only two other non-conference opponents in the top 100. Right now, it feels like Kansas State's still kind of in that 7 to 10 range uh, in the Big 12. You've got your top five of Kansas, Houston, Iowa State, Arizona, and Baylor. And then Texas Tech, Cincinnati, and BYU. I think they're all fairly clearly ahead of Kansas State right now. So that would put Kansas State closer to nine. I think they're probably ahead of TCU and then Central Florida, maybe even Arizona State kind of comes in after that. That kind of puts Kansas State already in a little bit of bubble conversation. It's too early to know. Obviously, they could rattle off a bunch of wins, beat St. John's, do well in the conference, and coast into the NCAA tournament. But I kind of get the sense that they're going to float around that bubble throughout the season, and I'm curious to see Jerome Tang mix and match with the talent they have on this roster. And I think this game against LSU will be a, a real good opportunity to see how this rotation tightens up against a quality opponent, uh, especially with a, a Chora Chora back in the mix. It's going to wrap it up for me today here on the Lockdown College Basketball Podcast. Folks, thank you so much to those of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Myself and co-host Isaac Shade will be back with you on Friday, getting you ready for a fun weekend of college basketball games. Cannot wait for that. But again, until then, thanks as always for listening. I want to say apologies to the lawyer family. I want to say let's go Wildcats. We just spent some time talking about that Kansas State team. And until Friday, peace out.